Praise God, everybody. No, this is not how I envisioned this weekend going, but nobody can predict the weather. And uh, I, I do feel like there's a conspiracy against us. It seems like it had all week to go below zero, and it waited till the weekend. But regardless, here we are. And uh, this Valentine's Day, uh, we're here to receive the word of the Lord. And um, it's different. I wish you were here. I wish we were together because the message that I have today, I would much rather minister in person. I guess any time I'd rather minister in person, but especially today. Uh, but at any rate, before we get into the Word of God, uh, I guess I should just give you an explanation. I've, times past, I have endeavored to make temperature zero, kind of like a cutoff point. Uh, not because I can't make it to church, or most of you can't make it to church, um, but especially since we have this kind of an opportunity, and we don't need it that often uh, without COVID, um, it's easier, I shouldn't say easier, it's more safe for us to do it this way. And I know you could get to church, I could get to church, and um, it's not dangerous until it is, and in this kind of weather, it's not just dangerous, but it's deadly. And as a shepherd, I, I don't want anybody to be harmed because we felt like we just had to be in the house of God. We'll be here next week, and um, God will be here. God's with you right now, and God's in this room. I've asked God to be with us today because I feel like this message is important. Not that any are not, but I, I especially feel this message is important to us. And um, so didn't want you to think that we didn't feel that service was, uh, it was not necessary to be here and we were going to be uh, a little careless about having in-service church now that we've done it for so long last year. That's not the case at all. I just don't want anybody to be harmed on their way here or on their way home this evening with temperature or tomorrow um, with, as I am recording this on Saturday evening, um, with temperatures this whole weekend, well below zero, and they say tomorrow even into uh, up to 25 to 30 below zero. I, I don't want someone to get hurt because of that. So for that reason, we are going to video services and, and bring them to you that way. Um, hopefully this will be one of the last ones uh, until next year when we have these winter days as well. But I'm glad that we have the opportunity to come to you via video when these situations occur so we don't have to just omit service. And I, I pray that your minds would be set to hear the Word of God, your spirit to receive the Word of God, because I certainly have a message for the church today. Um, before we get into the Word of God, I'd like us to go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to be with us, uh, not only just for the service, for the message, uh, we need the mind of God. We need to receive uh, the mind of God so we can receive the Word of God. And, uh, but not just for that, but also for several of our brothers and sisters. And I'm going to get in trouble quickly here. Uh, but we have several of our brothers and sisters who are really in need uh, of prayer. Um, so many that are sick and so many that are having uh, dire circumstances surrounding families. Um, you pray ask that you would pray with us for uh, Brother Chuck Taylor and his family from our Pekin campus and what they've gone through. Also, Brother Taylor's just had a hip replacement surgery on top of all the trauma that's gone on in his family. Um, but also, um, there, are, uh, there are those that are struggling right now. I know Sister Christine Scala has uh, a brother that's passed away. And um, like I said, I'm going to get in trouble here because I, it seems like in my mind there's so many things that are going on right now. Oh, yeah, uh, Brother Gary from Pekin as well uh, in the hospital right now uh, had surgery to remove a blood clot from his brain. And uh, just things happen so quickly in our life. We need the Lord. And so I'd ask you to pray for your brothers and sisters, hold them up before the throne, and then ask God to be with us for this message today, uh, because we can do nothing without him and uh, without the mind of Christ. This is just uh, words that uh, just sound good to the heart, but don't make a difference in our spirit. 
And so let's go to God and ask him to be with us today. Father, we love you and we're so grateful that we have this opportunity to come before you. Whether we're in the house of God, uh, in this location, or we're at home in our own house, in our other sanctuary. I'm so grateful that we have confidence to know that you are here among us. You are with us. As Brother uh, Rushing and I are here today, I know that you're here in this auditorium, but Lord, as different family members and each one of your, your children are at home separately, I know that you are there with them. And I ask that you would quicken our hearts, quicken our minds to receive the Word of God. God, let this Word change us. Let it somehow encourage us and, and cause us to realize that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. I pray, God, that you would be my, with my brothers and sisters who are struggling right now, who are going through crisis in their own life. Uh, Lord God, Sister Christine, God, comfort her heart, comfort her spirit. Only you know uh, the situation there. Only you can, you who are the, the comforter can understand what she's going through, and only you can give peace in that situation. I pray for Brother Gary as well. Lord God, let your hand of strength and healing and, and protection be upon my brother. Touch his body, I pray. Give him a speedy recovery. Somehow, God, through this, I pray that you would be glorified. Lord, I, I ask that you would bless him, bless his family, strengthen them as they endeavor to overcome whatever this is, whatever, whatever limitations, oh God, or whatever inconveniences this brings in life. I pray that, Lord God, that you would be with them and encourage them and direct them. I pray also for Brother Taylor that you would touch his family, strengthen his children, his, his daughter, his grandchildren. Lord, be with them, I pray, in this time of crisis. But also, God, I ask that you would give him a speedy recovery and touch his body. Lord, let all that we do and say be brought to you. You said cast your cares upon you because you care for us. And Lord, you're the only one that can do anything about this. So we bring these situations to you. Ask God, that you and in your infinite wisdom and infinite power would reach down into our lives and God, somehow, some way in this crazy world that we live in, you be exalted. Let your will be done and you receive glory in all that we go through. We're asking you to come down in the middle of it. We're asking that you would receive glory from it. We're asking and praying that your divine will would be done in the earth. God, not my will, but thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, I want to talk to you today from Psalms. I want to use a couple passages of Scripture I've referenced uh, here of late, but uh, I would like to talk to you today from Psalms 85 and 10 and Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Psalms 85 and 10, the psalmist writes, Mercy and truth are met together. Strange fellows to be together. What a, what a, a contradiction. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It's as if you take these two opposing forces and you bring them together in the first phrase. And in the second phrase, it tells you the outcome. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That's odd. I'll go on to explain it here in a little bit. Then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 21. The Apostle Paul's praying that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that you be rooted and grounded. Notice he doesn't say in doctrine, but he says in love. You and I have to be rooted and grounded in the love of God before we can accept and, and uh, progress in the doctrine of God. That you may be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all the saints. He goes on to describe this love, the, height, the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ... Oh, I wish that we knew the love of Christ. I wish that there was some way that I could somehow open the Word of God, that you and I would truly know the love of Christ. That passes knowledge. He goes on to say, I wish you could know it, and I pray that you could know it, but it passes human understanding that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, unto Him 
that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power of the love of God that works in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. I'd like to talk to you today for just a little bit on this subject. For the love of God. For the love of God. Often, I'll have the music team sing a song that correlates with my message. And if I would have done that today, the song would have been, I don't know why Jesus loves me. And I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. But I'm not going to leave it there. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm so glad that he did. Often we hear the title of my message used as a term of frustration or exasperation. But it's also used as a term of amazement. For the love of God. I, for one, never cease to be amazed by this love. Oh, the amazing love of God. The amazing love of God. I know that today is Valentine's Day, and uh, I even wore a red tie just to appease my daughters. Uh, I, I realize today's Valentine's Day, and most often I would not allow such a, to me, <laughs> a holiday to interrupt my message. However, Valentine's Day, or maybe some of you are calling it Halloween, but however, Valentine's Day is a day that we celebrate love and the relationship that love brings. I've often made the statement that if we could truly understand the love of God, we would be a whole lot more confident in our relation with Him. And that's His relationship with Him, as well as our ability to minister according to His purpose for our life. I'm, I, I'm afraid that we have... Uh, misjudged the love of God and we have limited the love of God because we've been so conditioned by this world that we live in that love is merited number one and that by our abilities or our character the truth of the matter is and I want you to understand this I know it's difficult to grasp, and especially with our finite minds and, and the way that we view love. I want you to understand this. God's love is absolute. It's encompassing. It's, it's everything. It, it's, it surrounds everything. It is everything. It's fundamental. It's the building blocks of who God is. And it's foundational. And all of that is in a part of his character. Therefore, it's not derivative from humanity at all. I can't add to God's love, nor can I detract from God's love. Well, we say, I know God loves the world, but what about me? I'm talking about you and I individually. You and I make up this world. And God loves you, plus or minus nothing. There's nothing you can do that will make God love you more. And there's certainly nothing you can do that will cause him to love you any less. You see, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 and 16 tells us God is love. Love is who he is, not what he does. Love is who God is. 1 John, or yeah, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, oftentimes we'll read, John 3 and 16, but 1 John 3 and 16, he writes years later, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Now, did he lay down his life for us when we were doing good? Did he lay down his life for us whenever we were perfect? No, it was in our imperfections that he laid down his life for us. Now, John 3, 16, that everybody knows and you could just about stop any stranger on the street and they could give you a version uh, of John 3 16 for God so loved the world that's you and I not the perfect not the saved not the redeemed but he loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish. Let me tell you, if you'll believe in the love of God, there's no way Satan can take you out of his grasp. 
There's nothing, the Apostle Paul said, that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing in your past. There's certainly nothing in your future that, you, that can separate you from the love of God. We should not perish, but have everlasting life. And verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, I know last year I, I preached and taught a lot about grace, and it's necessary. I love grace. I love the work of grace. And you and I need to allow grace to work in our lives. The truth of the matter is that grace at work in the life of a believer is salvation at work. Remember, Paul said, by grace, you are saved, and that not of yourself. We can't do enough in ourselves before or after receiving the Holy Ghost to merit salvation. It's grace that works in us that brings about salvation. One of the recurring problems with grace is, like the Galatians, you and I tend to fall from it. And as a result, our humanistic mindset of love, we feel we don't deserve grace to operate in our life. And from a human perspective, let me tell you, we don't. But thank God, He doesn't see us from a human perspective. All you and I can see is our wrongs and our failures and our past and, and our weaknesses. But all God can see is the opportunities for the blood of forgiveness and mercy to work and, and grace to work in the life of a believer. All God can see is your potential. I've often said that John 3.17 is just as important as a previous verse. And everybody knows John 3.16. But if you were to meet a stranger on the street or perhaps a Christian believer in, this, in the pew and ask him, do you know what John 3.17 says? Can you recite John 3.17 for me? They may, they, they may and they probably would look at you perplexed. Isn't that just like the enemy? To cancel out in our minds the free pass that God gives sinful humanity to enter into his mercy. For God loved the world. Yeah, we know that one. And at the end we say, yeah, but you don't know. Yeah, but. And then you and I need to go on and read 17. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't impute our trespasses uh, against us. He imputed his righteousness uh, to us. I feel that God has given me a directive to explore His mercy for the church for a season. Just as He taught me, talked to me last year about grace. And grace gives us something to look forward to. Grace gives us, it's like the reward that keeps us going, keeps us pushing. But grace is the opportunity to get there. Grace, is, grace becomes a vehicle, or, or mercy becomes a vehicle that gets us where we are to where grace can work in our lives. Mercy mind you, is just as important, if not more so, than grace. Because as I preached some time back, mercy is a qualifier for grace. You've got to get mercy before you can get grace. And we run from mercy. We hide from mercy. Because mercy deals with our wrongs. Mercy deals with our sins. Mercy deals with our shortcomings and our failures. But let me tell you, only by dealing with our shortcomings and our failures, only by dealing with who we're not, only by dealing with our, 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 our failures uh, can we enable God to, to use us to become more than what we could be, to enable us, to, to enable him to anoint our lives uh, to be people and men and women of God that we're not ashamed of. Therefore, you and I ought to embrace grace. You and I ought to embrace uh, him doing away with our sin, him remembering Removing the sin and the shame of who we are. To me, you see, mercy is love at work. It's not hard to love somebody in perfection. It's not hard to love me when I'm anointed. 
It's not hard to anoint me or to love me when, when I'm preaching uh, the gospel or when, I, when I'm laying hands on the sick and watching them recover or when I'm casting out devils or where, when I'm walking in the miraculous. It's not hard to love me then. But God commended his love towards us before we were perfect. Before he imputed his righteousness to us. Before old things had passed away. Mercy is love. Mercy is love at work. And God is love. Mercy is the love of God that finds us when we are unlovable by earthly standards. Even by our own. It seems the potential, rela- it love sees the potential relationship beyond my failures and makes a way possible. Love makes a way possible for you and I to deserve His love. And to my human mind, that last phrase seemed almost blasphemous because I know my weaknesses and you know your failures and we know how short we fall from the grace of God and from the perfection of God and to say that I deserve his love you see mercy makes a way to deserve the love of God in our sin we're only deserving of death for the wages of sin is death However, there's a transformation that takes place by the atoning blood of Calvary. Old things pass away and all things become brand new. And we become partakers of a divine nature and become adopted into the beloved. God doesn't see your failures. He doesn't see your wrongs. All he sees is the blood covering. And he's in love with humanity. And he said, my blood, my righteousness that is imputed unto you makes you deserve my love. So mercy, the big eraser. As we're born again, we're not only the children of God, but we're also a part of the bride. And through the application of his blood, he makes us without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Oh, that the blood could wash out our memory as well as it does God's. Now, I have an allegory to tell you a story. And uh, I'm not one that writes stories or even thinks them up or So it may seem a little corny as I'm not apt to tell stories, especially personally developed stories while I'm preaching. But it came to me while I was pondering this message today. I explained it to my wife. Actually, it came to me a few days ago and just kind of rolling it around in my mind, pushing it out of my mind, trying to get it out of my mind so I wouldn't have to make myself so vulnerable to be embarrassed by this story. But... I told it to my wife and my daughters, and they liked it. Kind of an application of what I'm talking about. So we'll blame this on them. You see, at first we were created perfectly and innocent in the likeness and image of our Creator. This was a state that we were created to fellowship God in for eternity. Innocence. This was the state that Adam and Eve were created to dwell in. Innocence. So my story starts as innocence, who was in love with God, has been seduced by destructive sin. Justice, which is the name of the righteousness of God, comes looking to demand payment for our sin. And we all know that the wages of that sin is death. Fortunately for innocence, you and I, mercy, the true love of humanity, came running and found justice before justice found you and I. So mercy, with lips painted blood red, distracted justice with the kiss of atonement, just long enough for grace, her helper to swoop in and find us. 
Grace enveloped us and helped us take off the old man's coat of betrayal. Grace put on that new coat of a new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness. And by the time justice found us, grace had helped us put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge and after the image of him that created him. Justice no longer recognized us for who we were because old things had passed away and all things had become new. Once again, we resembled our creator. Remember the one that we were created in his likeness and image. Through the power of grace, we had once again been conformed into the likeness of his image. Thanks to mercy and grace, we are now partakers of of a divine nature. And as a result, by His divine power, He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue and given us great and exceeding precious promises. Jude said this in 24th verse, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Not only did grace and mercy, not, not only did they, did they save me when I fell, but they're going to keep me from falling. And to present us, get this, in spite of what we've done, in spite of, uh, of all of uh, the list of offenses that justice had for us, uh, in spite of all that, he's going to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I'd like to remind you today that mercy found you before grace did. So before you were good enough for God to love, love in action was already chasing you. In fact, while you were dead in trespasses and sin, God loved you. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, our, our passage text today. But God who is rich in mercy. Every time justice comes looking for you, mercy's already there with a kiss of atonement. I've already paid the debt. I am rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, Did you hear that? Even when you were dead in sins, before you knew to love God, before you were trying to love God, he quickens us together with Christ. By grace, you're saved and raised us up out of who we were and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If God loved you when you were not even trying to love him, how much more does he love you and how much more will he help you uh, now that you are doing the best you possibly can and fail at times? Yes, you may fall. Yes, you may fail. But you fall in more perfection now than you did before you ever tried. At least when you fail now, you're failing trying to do good. How much more will your heavenly Father reach for you and allow mercy to cover you? Yes, the accuser of the brethren, he comes to condemn us. But remember, God didn't come into this world to condemn you. And I promise you that before the, before the, the accuser of the brethren gets there, mercy is already there with atonement ready to cover every cost. Mercy certainly found you before truth, justice. God's not mad at you. Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. I, I, I do know this. God's not willing that any should perish. And God does not willingly afflict. And that's out of the Old Testament. God is not mad at you. God loves you. And God's trying to bring us all to a place of repentance. God's trying to bring us all to a place of mercy. And sometimes he allows things that we have messed up in and, and he allows this, this sinful flirtation that innocence got herself into. He allows us to receive the, the consequences of that sin. Only, not because he's mad at us, only because he knows it will turn us and drive us to seek some kind of help. And mercy's sitting there waiting. Mercy is standing there waiting with atonement for you and I. 
God is not mad at you. God is not punishing you. That's the condemnation of the enemy that would like to get between you and God. Remember, God didn't come into the world to condemn the world. That's the enemy. God's trying to redeem you from the cost of your failures. For the love of God, would you embrace mercy so that you can find grace to help you in time of need? Adam and Eve had sinned, falling from their state of innocence. God wasn't angry at them. In fact, he was already looking for a way to cover their sin. He was already looking for a way to atone for the death payment that was imminent. You know the story how he said, you can have anything in the garden. Just don't eat of the tree of good and evil. Isn't it just like us to flirt with disaster? And Eve finds herself near the garden, near the tree flirting and falls into temptation and eats of the tree and gives to Adam and he eats of the tree. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now that's amazing because that's the same time God came every other day. This time, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Notice, God was not the one who acted any different. God was not the one that separated himself from them. In fact, God was at the place that he always was. God was there at the same time he always does, was. In the same manner he always was. He was wondering, where is Adam? Do you think God was surprised that Adam had sinned? No, we know he wasn't. He already knew that sin would enter the world because Revelation tells us that he was a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Before before he said, let there be light, he knew he would have to come because he knew Adam and Eve would sin and that Adamic nature would follow us uh, throughout creation. Before you were born, God knew that you would sin, yet he still called you. He's still calling you. Our humanity doesn't bother God. Just like Adam's nakedness never bothered God. God created Adam naked. God created you human. Your humanity doesn't bother him in in reality. And neither does your sin. It's only the unconfessed sin that bothers God. It's only the sin that we won't allow him to cover with his blood that bothers God. You see, he created enough mercy to cover all your failures before you fail the first time. God's only questions were, where are you? And who condemned you? Who told you you were naked? First, where are you? I would ask you that today. Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you in your confidence in your relationship with God? Are you hiding because you're afraid that God's mad at you? Are you hiding because you're worried that God's going to condemn you? Are you worried that God doesn't know already and God don't love you anymore? I'm here to tell you that God loves you in spite of all of your wrong. If you're a believer and God has filled you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, He did that in spite of knowing that you was going to fail down the road. Who told you that you were naked? Where are you? Where are you in this? Why are you hiding? If you'll come boldly before the throne of grace, God said we can take care of this with mercy. Mercy. 
Who told you you were naked? Who told you that you were a failure? Who told you you couldn't do this? Who told you that there was no anointing to cover you? Who told you that you couldn't do what God has called you to do? Who told you you couldn't be a Christian? Who told you you couldn't live for God? Who told you that you were a failure? Who told you that condemnation did not come from God? That condemnation came from your enemy. If he can get you to doubt the love and the mercy of God, he can keep you in your sin. Remember, you have to come boldly. You have to come boldly before the throne of grace. Not proud, not brazen, but come with full confidence that I know I have messed up, but I know that he shed his blood for my mess up. And I know if I come humbly into his presence asking forgiveness, I know he will forgive me. And he'll give me grace to beat this thing the next time. Or the next time. Or the next time. Said a righteous man falls seven times, but it gets back up. That's not a number. That's not seven times that he failed. That means he's a complete failure. That's number seven is a number of completion. Jesus told Simon Peter, forgive your brother 70 times seven. Well, if he asks that of us, what about him? How often will he forgive you and I? No, the enemy comes along and tries to get us to condemn ourselves. Or allow him to condemn us. For the love of God. For the love of God. For the cause of the cross. Will you not embrace the mercies of God? They're there for you each and every day. He said I make them fresh, brand new every morning. Come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy. Come on. You got to walk out of that condemnation. You got to walk out of that prison. You got to walk out of wherever you are. That, that oppressiveness that says, God doesn't want me, that I can't do this, that I've gone too far, that I've done too much, or I, I've, I've done it too many times. Come on. Leave that behind you. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Are you telling me that the blood of Jesus Christ is not powerful enough to cleanse us? No, you know that's not true. This means that you've got to have faith in his love. You've got to have faith in his love. I wish you were here today because I feel I could could minister so much more adequately God's love for you if you were here in person, but you're not. So you're just going to have to hear the word of the Lord. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. No wonder it was a yearning desire of the Apostle Paul that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and that you being rooted and grounded not in your abilities, not in your merit, not in your anointing, but that you would be rooted and grounded in love. Because I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, there's going to be times that you're going to fail, and it's not going to be your merit that picks you back up. It's going to be your faith in the love of God. That that's you're rooted and grounded in God loves me and nothing can separate me from the love of God. Not even my own failures. You be rooted and grounded in love that you may be somehow able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know To truly know the love of Christ that passes understanding. It passes knowledge. Because if you could get a grip on this, the apostle Paul said that you would be filled with the fullness of God. What would you do? What would you attempt to do for God if you knew his love was unfailing towards you? Now, he says, 
now that we've established that, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Because you can't fathom the love of God. According to the power that worketh in us. The Apostle Paul said back in Romans that the love of God was shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. I would to God today on Valentine's Day that somebody would get a grip on the height, the length, the depth, and the breadth of the love of God. And you would never doubt yourself again. You would never doubt the love of God towards you again. And that you would greet each and every day brand new for the love of God. I beseech you on this Valentine's Day, for the love of God, embrace his mercy. And then abide in his mercy. Because mercy is not merited. Remember, it's for wrongs. And it's freely given. I love you. But God loves you so much more. I pray as this message comes to a close, that you would somehow, some way, grab a hold of this, bury it deep within your heart, and never allow the enemy to get between you and mercy again. Father, seal this word in our heart. God, we don't understand your love because in reality, how could we? We can't understand you. Your ways are above our ways. You're unlimited. You're eternal. And our ways are finite. They're limited by time and abilities and strength. It's very hard for us to grasp the eternal. God, you love us with an everlasting love. I pray somehow today that in my faltering ways I have influenced this wonderful group of people that you love them, you care for them, and you're going to use them. The enemy wants to condemn them, Lord, because he knows what they're capable of. He knows if they ever get past their weaknesses and realize that your strength is made perfect in those that they will tear his kingdom to pieces and build the kingdom of God. And I believe that's where we're headed. I know that's where you're headed with this. We have got to have faith in you and in ourselves and our relationship with you. So seal this in our spirit. Your will be done in earth as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.